It began on July 7th, 2023. Larian Studios held a panel live stream with press and various content creators to show them new features and gameplay of their upcoming RPG, Baldur's Gate 3. The dev team were passionate, talkative, fun, and extremely engaged with the audience and chat of the stream. Despite some streaming issues, the panel was a success and got people excited for a new title, but it did something more than that. Something that many development studios and publishers want to achieve before their games even come out. Hype. The way studios typically do this is with video game set pieces and teasers. And so did Larian, but not like you think. Play the clip. What you just saw was a sex scene between two characters that can happen in-game. One being the player and the other a druid, who can of course shapeshift into a bear. And this moment here goes viral that next day. Articles, memes, reactions, specialists and authorities on the subject of lovemaking all gather and discuss, while people who have never heard of Baldur's Gate 3 are very, very confused. This causes huge amounts of traffic for the game, and people begin playing the early access even though the game is about to release in the next coming weeks. And in those weeks, something that no industry professional of any caliber predicted. The game blows up. Baldur's Gate 3 is such an achievement. Baldur's Gate 3 is taking the internet by storm. Baldur's Gate 3 just feels like a video game in its purest form. Baldur's Gate 3, one of, if not the best game I've ever played. For a lot of fans of RPGs, this was a hope. A light at the end of a dark tunnel. A tunnel whose walls were dashed with the blood of their favorite games, massacred by the corporate agenda of microtransactions, DLC, battle passes, skins, pay to win, unpatched issues, and bugs upon bugs upon bugs. Gamers felt that this was a step forward toward a better games industry. An industry with the consumers first. In fact, not long before the game released, a thread on Twitter caused discourse around the game's potential to change the standards and raise the bar for what games should strive to be and practices that developers should adhere to. And it's this discussion that I want to delve into in this video. Not really what people said specifically, but the intention of what people want and why they are saying this, and ultimately, if it's even possible for one game to change the standards for the entire industry. So sit down, grab a drink, and let me, Mugen, tell you all about it. Let's talk about Baldur's Gate 3 and what it did to the games industry. To start, I want to give some context on the series Baldur's Gate for those who don't know, and its origins will be something very relevant later on. So, what the hell is Baldur's Gate? To do that, we have to go back in time. To a simpler time before horse armor, and before NPC streamers. A time where if you bought a game, you owned it, whether it was finished or not. A time known as 1998. Baldur's Gate was developed by a small unknown developer at the time who had one game under their belt, but they would become pioneers of the modern RPG gaming scene as the years went on. Bioware. Creators of Dragon Age, Mass Effect, and of course, the critically acclaimed Anthem. Anyway. The game was published by Interplay Entertainment and Black Isle Studios, who were known for making titles in the computer role-playing game genre, or CRPGs. These games follow players interacting with a world or story different from ours that relied on the player's ability to play the role of a character. These games adapted the playstyle of tabletop genre of role-playing games, most famously Dungeons & Dragons. The tabletop rules gave these computer games the basis of weapons, stats, classes, abilities, and the creativity to approach conflict in a multitude of ways. Hence why they were known as CRPGs. Because what kind of RPG goes on a computer, you know what I'm saying? This term commonly nowadays when we refer to a CRPG is replacing the C that stands for computer with classic. The implication of this is because RPGs themselves are such a wide genre nowadays. Basically now to be considered an RPG, you need a skill tree and a level up mechanic. I mean, you've heard of the successful RPG Assassin's Creed, right? 
So these games that involve top-down strategy mechanics, old-school role-playing elements like persuasion checks, inventory management, deep character interactions, and ability actions are CRPGs. There were many games before 98 that had this approach, especially the role-playing aspect of experience quests and react to them based on you or your character's values. Wasteland, Fallout, and the gold box classics like Pool of Radiance, which utilized the world of D&D itself. The game had an interesting and arduous development cycle, and there is a great in-depth video from Mr. Edders if you want to know more. Link is in the description. But on that fateful day of December 21st, gamers experienced an RPG that was critically praised by both computer gamers and D&D enthusiasts alike. To give you an idea of Baldur's Gate's success, at launch, Interplay employees had to work a bit over their Christmas vacation to help restock shelves for the holidays. You could say they were suffering from success, and many believe that the game succeeded because not only its roots in being a CRPG, but adding real-time action of an RTS game. Common RTS games around the time were very popular, like Command & Conquer and Warcraft. The namesake of the game was the infamous city Baldur's Gate. The game's main focus of interaction is dialogue, combat, and exploration. Combat happens in real time or can be paused by the player mid-combat in order to make decisions slowly and calmly. The game adheres to the second edition AD&D rule set, meaning every time a character hits an enemy, a certain dice is rolled via the computer and instantly calculates the damage as it is done. Something Bioware later became famous for was player interactions with companions, something that modern RPGs have forgotten today. Companions accompany the player not because they're the chosen one or because they are the player, but because their goals or interests temporarily align. They have their own priorities like a real character. Having your dialogue and actions affect your relationship with them. You are not the main character, but a character. Like everyone else who all have their own goals and dreams to achieve. I was amazed to also learn that Baldur's Gate supported multiplayer. So you could, like a D&D game, play a campaign with friends. I didn't know technology was possible like this in the 90s. Now, after that, a few things happened. Bioware made a few expansions, a sequel, some more expansions. They make Neverwinter Nights, a couple spin-offs. Bioware lose the license as Interplay slowly go bankrupt. The CRPG genre becomes niche. TRS become Wizards of the Coast. Bioware go on to make Mass Effect, Knights of the Old Republic, Dragon Age, and Sonic the Dark Brotherhood. Huh. Wizards get bought by Hasbro, Baldur's Gate lies dormant until being re-released on Steam in 2012. So how do our heroes Larian fit into all this? Well, around the time of the 2010s, Kickstarter was used to fund many creative projects including games. It was here that both CRPGs and scams began to be revitalized by veterans and newcomers alike, creating games for an audience looking for something they remember and even an audience looking for something new. One such studio are the heroes of our story, Larian Studio. Studios, led by founder Sven Vinke. During this era, Larian were trying to finish Divinity Original Sin, but required additional funds to complete it, so they turned to Kickstarter. The game releases and actually captures an entire group of players who are all scrounging for an RPG they had never played before, and Larian were making that kind of game. With Divinity 1 finished and a lot of CRPG experience under their belt, Larian approached Wizards of the Coast for the chance to make Baldur's Gate 3. But the decision makers saw Larian as too fresh and unproven to handle such an established IP. So, Sven and the team got to work. Seeing the success of Div 1 and an audience clamoring for this type of game, they went all in. Larian launched a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter for Original Sin 2 in August of 2015, and within 12 hours, they had reached their goal of $500,000, in total raising over 2 million US dollars for the development of the game. They launched an early access release in September of 2016, and cooked for a whole year listening to an audience that wanted more games like this to succeed. They refined the combat they cultivated in Divinity 1, and made a more memorable cast and story. The game fully released for PC in September 2017. In one week, they had 75,000 players on Steam, which became one of the most played Steam games at the time. 
Critics loved it, and so did people wanting a game that had branching narratives and character choices. The combat was creative while using a turn-based rule set akin to D&D with movement and action points. Some began to crown Larian the new kings of the CRPG genre, but soon the real challenge would begin. After seeing some material of Divinity 2, the Wizards came back and asked if they still want Baldur's Gate 3. Larian said yes. And as they released Divinity 2, they started their early concepts for Baldur's Gate 3. Six years of total development, a teaser trailer, and then early access for another three years, we arrive here today. The bear scene was a quality meme for a bit, but it also spoke to RPG fans besides just their lust. That scene accurately showcased the complexity and scenarios that came about in an RPG of this size. Not size like Skyrim of go anywhere and do anything, no. Size as in interactivity. If you don't play as a druid or a warlock, you can't speak to animals, who are viable and interesting NPCs. Like this ox. You gotta talk to this ox when you get the chance, trust me. If I romance Gale, but also have high approval of Shadowheart, she may confess to me, and I have to choose. Obviously, I'm picking Shadowheart. Like, she's my best girl. Like, oh, I love her so much, dude. I have to get into this goblin camp. So, do I smear shit on my face to gain safe entry? Or do I bite off one of their toes? There are so many ways to play in and out of combat. Banging Humphrey is just one way to play. Now, I know I have hardly gotten to industry standards, or anything, but I think the history of these games are important, as is the resume of Larian Studios. A studio can grow from anywhere and be as successful and still retain practices lost on other developers. It also shows that Baldur's Gate was big for its time, and in turn changed the standards of what people wanted at the time. But around this time of Larian's success was an era that we like to refer to as the Age of Fucking Broken Games. But before that, we need to talk about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is your go-to online service that connects you with their extensive network of licensed therapists around the clock. Setting up sessions is simple, even on your phone, enabling text and call conversations. This flexibility ensures you maintain a strong connection with your therapist, especially when life throws rocks in your way. BetterHelp therapists respond promptly, providing the support you need when you need it. To ensure you find the perfect match, BetterHelp lets you share your needs and aspirations through a detailed questionnaire. This personal touch ensures you're paired with a therapist you truly connect with. And today, BetterHelp is offering a 10% discount on your first month with the code MUGEN. As someone who benefited from therapy in my younger days, and with numerous friends and family members finding solace in it, I can vouch for its effectiveness. In today's busy world, where finding time to talk can be challenging, BetterHelp can bridge that gap. So visit betterhelp.com slash Mugen, or simply click the link in the description to enjoy your first month at a 10% discount. That's betterhelp.com slash Mugen. And thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Okay, back to games. To talk about broken games, we have to do a test. What do you think of when you see this? This is an apology made by the studio of CD Projekt Red for the launch of Cyberpunk 2077, a title so hyped beyond belief only to launch as an extremely buggy and unfinished product on all platforms. CD Projekt Red share a resemblance to our friends from Larian, besides Europe. They were invested in a genre and an IP that they wanted to make a great game for. For Larian, it was Baldur's Gate. For CD Projekt Red, it was The Witcher. But this apology post seems to be the calling card of many studios and publishers who have fallen short on their promises to their audience. For a variety of reasons. We know the tale, in fact, is as old as time. Developers succeed and grow, to which they then have to appease corporate individuals who invest in the company or who own them as a publisher. This results in customers getting charged full price and receiving a game half-baked. This can be seen doubly worse in live service games that have single player components. They are designed to be a financial cash cow, to keep the company wealthy by funneling constant payments from players. These games can also be grindy, full of pay skips, and have minimal patches that balance and fix the gameplay. 
So post Baldur's Gate Bear Scandal, we began to see discussion on Twitter about game development with many people including this man here, saying that while this game is an achievement and we should be proud of it both gamer and developer alike, do not expect this to be the standard of video games going forward as Larian have made themselves a unicorn. A game that no one expected and a game no other studio could make, which received a variety of reactions. There were heaps of developers and gamers affirming yes. Of course, different circumstances and developers make different pizza. But there was this air around some devs who used this almost as a shield to discourage higher expectations both of themselves and from their audience. This echoed a sentiment from gamers and journalists like IGN who lashed out exclaiming, why shouldn't people have a higher standard? Why shouldn't we expect more when we live in the age of the AAA mobile game? Now, I'm a guy who doesn't really have any experience in game development. I don't have any experience in game development, but I have played games a lot of my life, and I play what I like and I don't play what I don't like. But I do know that in any work environment, crunch is hard and not ideal and should not be a resolution. To me, when I think of higher expectations for games, I conjure up a realistic release date and a feature complete game with minimal to no game breaking bugs. And I know that seems to be a rare commodity nowadays, as it isn't boots on the ground developers coding battle passes into the next patch instead of fixing the frame rate or even creating the feature promised on reveal, but executives who have never once keyframed a PowerPoint presentation making these decisions. Now I know it is not the consumer's job to care whether or not the job is hard or what things have to be done to get it finished and make it fun, but there is a hard truth to this argument of having better expectations and game standards, because standards is a vague term and it fluctuates from person to person. Think of any game that has made a splash in the zeitgeist of gaming, and then think of the games that came out right after that. What kind of games came out after Amnesia? More first person horror games like Outlast. Dark Souls, what came out more Souls clones. Telltale Games, there were more point and click decision games. Witcher 3 and Breath of the Wild, more open world RPG games based on already known properties like Assassin's Creed. Even multiplayer games adhere to this. After WoW, what came out? More MMOs. Fortnite, even more Battle Royale games. Hades and Isaac, more roguelikes. Hollow Knight, more Metroidvanias. All these games of different sizes and budgets or developers made an impact and thus the consumer and the industry reacted. Now, if you had told me a year from now that Baldur's Gate 3 would cause such a splash in the industry that people were questioning their purchases, I would say you've been sitting in the skooma den too long, brother. You got some skooma, eh? Right, buddy? But ultimately, history had repeated itself. Like the original Baldur's Gate, it had revitalized what made people interested in a good, well-made CRPG. To say Baldur's Gate 3 sets a new standard for games is vague, because that depends a lot on what the audience wants. And here is why the success of Baldur's Gate 3 ultimately doesn't change anything about the games industry. It's because of you. Sven Vinke in an interview with PC Gamer had this to say about the debate surrounding Baldur's Gate 3. This is video games. Standards just die every day. Things get reinvented. New things appear all the time. When I was starting out in the industry, Assassin's Creed set the new standard. It was over. Nobody could make games like Assassin's Creed. There was too much budget behind it. That was going to be the future. Everybody had to consolidate. So if people's standards haven't really changed, and this is just something people want to play right now, why did Baldur's Gate 3 blow up? If Larian just made Baldur's Gate 3 in the style of the originals, that would mean there should be over 800,000 people playing games like Wasteland, Pillars of Eternity, and the original Fallout games. It's more than just fun game equals success. So many great games don't succeed or have any budget to get their name out there and be extremely profitable. I wouldn't even say it's the brand of Baldur's Gate because, bro, I can't remember the last time someone who was around my age asked me if I remember trying to play it on a box TV PC when I was five. The reason I think is because of games like Elden Ring or Zelda. It scratched an itch. An itch not scratched for people who like interacting in story and gameplay like an old school RPG with so many numerous paths as soon as you press start adventure. If anything, companies may try to make a game like this if they see sales fluctuate, but they won't keep at it for long. But will this one game change everything? 
force developers and corporates to reconsider adding in monetization, which makes them huge amounts of money, stop them from making FIFA Ultimate teams? No. It's because even if you like Baldur's Gate 3, and you play it, and you love it, there are players who will eventually go back to playing the newest title of a franchise that you are hopelessly addicted to, criticizing its design choices and bugs despite the fact you spend your time still playing it. Because nearly every gamer has this FOMO, especially when a new game comes out. This video isn't here to tell you what to buy and how to spend your money because it is a moot point to me. But if you're someone who loves that a game like this exists and what it stands for in its design and studio practices, plus gamers just getting better experiences, good, awesome, support them and play their game, especially if you enjoy it. But don't preach how studios shouldn't make garbage if you keep buying it and eating it. You are just as part of the problem as I am. It's like going to the local Maccas and saying to them after you get your food at the window, you know you shouldn't put so much MSG in this, right? It's really bad for people. So besides standards not changing, what can we get from Larian out of all of this? Well, inspiration. Competition does breed innovation, and there is a lot of RPG developers out there that I hope are seeing what Baldur's Gate 3 is doing. Regardless of size, you should be trying to implement this, and you can do it even if you're not a AAA developer. So to end this video, I want to go through those right now and just show what a game like this can do for people of all sizes. First is RPG mechanics and decisions. When I play RPGs, it does feel like sometimes there are only two branching paths, good guy or the bad guy. What I think evokes how you play in Baldur's Gate 3 in terms of dialogue is the variety of dialogue choices, but also what the game isn't telling you. The game never says, this is the villain path. There is no icon that says bad karma or mean decision, just text. The only inclination the game gives you are how people react to your choices. Just like decisions in real life, you may think you're right and some people won't agree. Those reactions can be positive or negative or just indifferent. How you react to characters choosing what to do affects your perception of them, as do their view of who you are. Role-playing games with decisions should have decisions that are wildly varied than just two paths, and have characters that react to them, because otherwise you're just expressing your moral choices to yourself. Speaking of characters, I'm shocked not more of today's technology isn't being utilized in games with characters who we spend a lot of time with. Bethesda games, I'm looking at you in particular. You think a Mr. Beast thumbnail is Uncanny Valley? You seen a Bethesda conversation before? Come on, pass the schooner already. In RPGs, where talking to lots of characters is common and you're going to be seeing them from a close third or first person perspective, they should feel real. It takes time to animate facial expressions and gestures, even with performance capture, and I know not every studio has the budget and so they have to use animated PNGs. But it so pays off in how you utilize that technology, and it gets people more invested in characters. When you think of characters from Skyrim, you might think of the mean characters, because they had so much more personality than many of the main characters, despite movement animations. So take a scene in Skyrim. If you decide to kill Parthenax, a peaceful dragon, the blades are like, good job, but if you talk to the Greybeards, they chew you out while also walking their set AI path prey at some lights or some candles. There's no scene of being banished from the mountain, they don't ban you from their chapel, in fact nothing changes, just the dialogue they say to you on repeat. I've seen a Persona conversation have more reactions than this. So let's look at Baldur's Gate 3. When you accidentally kill everybody's favorite femboy romance character, Astarian. What in the sweet hells were you thinking? Activating that lot, I was right there! God! Do you have any idea how much that hurt? Next time. No, no, no. If there is a next time, I'll be the one aiming the all powerful weapon. Thank you. Look at how believable he is. The way he exaggerates, just being killed was such an annoyance to him. It was an inconvenience that any of this had to happen because of you. Characters don't necessarily need to look unbelievably realistic, but they should feel realistic. Next is quests and the world, and RPGs to me don't need an expansive world to feel big. If the map is small but everyone I talk to has something interesting to learn from and help me solve quests in that area, that is much more noticeable and interesting. 
In Baldur's Gate 3, every time I walk down a path, I know I'm going to come across somebody or something that may or may not tie back to what's happening in the region. And that offers replayability because even though I know what might be there in my next playthrough, how I play it might change. If I'm playing as a rogue and I'm sneaking into every single person's house, I might learn something about them that I didn't before. And it feels like I'm constantly discovering stuff or looking for it. Because I can talk to animals, I'm talking to every animal I come across, even if the one thing they have to say is that grass tastes good. RPGs that boast 50 hours worth of side quests like it's a feature, to me that sounds really daunting. I would rather less quests with more quality and have them feel less like a checklist of stuff I have to do just to farm XP. Because in Baldur's Gate 3, while leveling up does get you things, it's not a priority in your mind to get stronger. It's a priority in your mind to explore the world and figure out what happens at the end of this quest, which fetch quests won't ever do. Now, the last thing I want to touch upon can apply more to than just RPGs, and that is updates. Some of the games I have shown in this video have been patched to a point of having a core audience and a fan base that is now enjoying the game. That involves a certain amount of trust that a developer will eventually patch issues. But to the players, actions speak louder than I'm sorry. Baldur's Gate 3 has some bugs for sure. There's a lot of shit going on there, but they released it with the technology proven from early access. And just after two and a half weeks of being released, they pushed a major patch that fixed over 1,000 issues in the game. Most notably, fixing the cutscene of having gnomes and dwarves be able to kiss our tall ladies again. Actually, when I just recorded this audio, I learned of a new patch that's coming out soon, patch 2, which in fact fixes characters being in certain cutscenes in the endgame and even adding in cutscenes scenes for companions that players felt like they didn't get a perfect resolution. That is maintaining and striving for quality. I noticed a lot when watching their old Kickstarter videos that Sven always said, whether it was Divinity 1, 2 or Baldur's Gate 3, that Larian is making the best game they had ever made. You won't achieve perfection, but you should always have a mindset to be at least close. To cap off, I want to say that what Larian wants to do is make games that I want to play. And if they can continue to self-publish, use early access and play a trust correctly, then the future of RPGs is going to only get more interesting. Industry practices of today will still be here, however long people still pay for them. I'm an optimistic guy, but I'm also a realist. Gamers spend their time and lives enjoying games they love in spite of their flaws. And sometimes we enjoy them in spite of their flaws a bit too much. And those who criticize the things they love will still buy the product because they have FOMO or they see not buying as pointless because everyone else will. But I'll leave a quote from Sven, which I think put a cherry on this clusterfuck of a cake that is the games industry. I think you should always strive to evolve, especially in this medium which is different than other media in the sense that technological evolution has always been a big part of it. There's always been innovation, but at the same time, it doesn't require massive technological evolution to do something crazy and cool and different than what anybody else has done before.